Very, very good to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, my name is Jaburi Ghazul from ETH Zurich. Let me just introduce you as well. You're Ray Huey. Um, Correct. From Washington State University. University, University of Washington. University of Washington, sorry, yeah. at uh, Seattle. Uh -huh. um, and I understand that uh, you did your master's with Eric Pianca. That's correct. Um, at Texas, and uh -huh. then you did your PhD at Harvard. Yes. I'd really like to start by asking you about your early career and what really got you involved in tropical ecology. Tropical biology. So uh, I went as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Uh, majoring in zoology, but my intent was uh, to go to medical school. Uh, but as a zoology major, I'd taken a couple of courses in sort of natural history that were tremendously fun and exciting. And so I was starting to waver whether to go to medical school or go to graduate school. Um, and right before I graduated in January of 1966, uh, Larry Wolf, who had been a TA in one of the courses that I had, told me about an OTS Fundamentals of Tropical Ecology course that winter. And I applied and was lucky enough to get in. Um, I had never taken a real ecology course. I'd never been to the tropics, so I was pretty green. Uh, but that course was uh, really a life-changing experience for me um, and uh, decided to become a biologist and not a doctor, something for which I am eternally grateful. And I suspect thousands of patients at this point are eternally grateful as well. <laughs> So that's a very brave decision to make at that stage. There must be something particularly inspirational about that course. Can you tell us a little bit more about the course? Yes. Um, I think that there were several key events that, that really triggered the decision to go into biology. And the first happened very early in the course. Uh, we went to Guanacaste, to the Haganar farm. And uh, in one of the afternoons there, uh, Dan Jansen gave a talk uh, which uh, at the time he called Why Mountains Were Higher in the Tropics, and it was published uh, the next year as Why Mountain Passes Were Higher in the Tropics. That talk, uh, is I can still remember very, very vividly, even though it was almost 50 years ago, um, and it was my first introduction to conceptual ecology. It was the most integrative uh, idea I'd ever heard. It had climates, tropical temperate, uh, altitude, mountains, physiology, all wrapped into one really beautiful, simple idea. Um, and I remember being extremely excited about it, but um, it just sort of started to ferment in my brain. Um, a second thing that happened uh, towards the end of the course, we went to Cerro de la Muerte, and it was cold. <laughs> we had been in the lowland tropics for almost two months at that point. I got up to the Cerro and I was just freezing. And Norm Scott led us on a, a field project studying uh, the thermal biology of Scoloporus malachiticus, a really beautiful lizard that lives at high altitude. And I was stunned that these lizards in this incredibly cold place could bask and achieve body temperatures that were really warm. And that sort of reinforced Dan's presentation about temperature and physiology and behavior and integrating that into a tropical context. Um, so up until that point, I thought that if I became a zoologist, I would study birds. But it was so much fun and so easy to work with lizards that, uh, and the thermal start stuff just instantly appealed to me, uh, that I decided uh, I'm going to become a biologist, but I'm going to work on lizards, not on birds. Uh, so uh, that two months I spent here uh, in Costa Rica changed my life and uh, affected the kinds of work that I do. Uh, but my interest in physiological ecology and uh, really traces to Dan's, Dan's lecture, and it's haunted my entire career. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about um, your subsequent work with lizards and particularly your involvement with OTS. OTS. Um, my had very limited interaction with OTS directly after my course, but two of my first students both participated uh, in OTS, uh, and both of them did parts of their thesis uh, here, uh, working on aspects, testing uh, assumptions in Janssen's hypothesis. Uh, and uh, I did my part of my thesis work uh, in the tropics, but in uh, the Caribbean. 
Uh, so it was directly affected by the OTS experience, but it wasn't, wasn't here. Um, and did work on, a lot of work on thermal biology of, of reptiles, uh, trying to understand how habitat and seasonality affects uh, ecology and reproduction. Um, but eventually stopped doing field work and started doing work on Drosophila because I wanted to do experimental evolution. Um, so there was about a 15 year uh, period in my career uh, where I was not doing uh, sort of real physiological ecology. It was basically laboratory evolution, but I've come back. <laughs> I'd like to ask you about that switch in a minute, but mm -hmm. I have one more question before then, and that is, um, what advice would you give to young students setting out on their uh, careers? Uh, in, uh, advice in terms of how do they find their way? There are so many things they can do. How would they carve uh, a furrow for themselves? Um, I can say two bits of advice. Once. Uh, sometime in the mid-70s, Ernst Meyer came to Berkeley when I was a postdoc, and I gave him a ride to the airport, and I was not yet an evolutionary biologist, so I was trying to figure out what the hell <laughs> to say to Ernst Meyer. In this, right? And I asked him, how do you stay fresh in biology? And his comment was, go to seminars. That was his most important suggestion. And I think I would apply that to a beginning student as well. You really don't know what's going to tweak your interest try different things. Um, uh, in my initial thesis work, uh, master's work at the University of Texas, I tried three or four different projects and discovered they weren't for me. And I finally found a project that I got excited about. Um, and I've seen that in many, many people. Um, they start a project either because they worked for someone uh, who was doing that, uh, and they're not, they're not heart and soul into it. But I think the key thing is to discover, by sampling a variety of different things, find something that just gets you so excited that that's all you think about and want to do. Uh, and I think Meyer's idea of going to seminars, getting exposed to a variety of ideas helps. One of the reasons that OTS is important is that anyone coming through an undergraduate program or a graduate program is exposed to relatively few kinds of ideas. You come here, there's a cluster of students from many other universities with different perspectives. There are course personnel from all over the world. You're going to be exposed to a diversity of biology, not just diversity of organisms in, a, in an environment. Um, that for me was one of the exciting things. People, meeting people like Dan Jansen, Charles Michener, uh, Tom Shaner, who was a student in the class, uh, those are just eye-opening experiences. Uh, and uh, eventually I found something that was truly exciting to me and that's all I wanted to do. Uh, Your work on lizards is, is absolutely fascinating, um, but then you made that sudden switch to Drosophila. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why you made that switch and also has the lizard work informed the work on Drosophila or is it completely separate? Well, the lizard work drove the work on flies. Um, we had been doing a lot of work on uh, adaptation of thermal physiology to deserts, mountains, and various things. But the work was all descriptive, uh, his historical, using phylogenetic approaches, but it was not experimental. And I wanted to know um, if there's climate change is there adequate genetic variation for an organism to be able to shift its thermal sensitivity? Doing that with lizards would be really hard. And so I started looking around for an organism where I could do quantitative genetics, where I could do laboratory uh, evolution, um, and decided to work on fruit flies. My colleague, Al Bennett, who's also uh, worked on reptile physiological ecology. Al, at exactly the same time, switched to working on E. coli, doing uh, laboratory natural selection. And I think it was just a trend at the time in the late 80s and early 90s uh, where uh, a lot of us were becoming interested in evolutionary things. And uh, we really needed to work on model organisms to answer those questions. But the questions ca came directly out of the lizard work. It's just that we couldn't didn't see an easy way to answer them. You've indicated in your papers that you feel that uh, tropical lizards are particularly sensitive to mm -hmm. climate change. Um, and this clearly has a conservation relevance. Mm -hmm. But I 
I don't think that lizards are high up in people's awareness, the general public's awareness. <laughs> Maybe you disagree. How do you, how do you get lizards into people's awareness? Oh, it's, I don't know, actually. I mean, people pay attention to large, gaudy birds and butterflies uh, that are very conspicuous. Um, lizards are less conspicuous. Uh, if you go to the Caribbean, on the other hand, they are very conspicuous there, because they're on almost every tree you'll see an Anolis lizard. Uh, but in a place like Central America, they're not conspicuous, and the same thing is true in the U.S. I think they're just not as well known. Um, I think the best way is, is the advantage of working with lizards is that we can do things with them that's hard to do with other organisms. We can easily take a lizard's temperature and monitor that. Uh, we can put transmitters in them. They're big enough to be able to do that. Uh, to try to do the same kinds of things in a small insect, which might be economically really important, uh, it's just tougher to do. Uh, so I think we can use the lizards uh, as an indicator of what's likely to apply to other kinds of ectotherms, uh, terrestrial ectotherms, primarily things like insects. and. Uh, so we're using them basically as an indicator species. So over the period that you've been working on lizards, which, if I may say, spans uh, at least a few decades, <laughs> um, how do you feel the research agenda has changed over that period? I think changes in several different directions. One, there was a long history of comparative work. That is, comparing, say, heat tolerances of montane and desert species, or open versus forest species. There's, there was a long tradition of that, but um, one of the things that really happened fairly early, um, in, like in the early 80s, was an awareness of uh, putting that into a phylogenetic context and trying to actually map the evolution of physiological traits on trees. And that's uh, turned out to be sort of a major advance, driven to a large extent by Joe Felsenstein's 1985 paper. Uh, uh, that's one whole area. Um, in terms of physiological ecology, a lot of us were doing work on thermal biology uh, because it was very obvious to us that if you're trying to predict when and where a lizard was going to be active, the best indicator of that would be the temperature. So it was a very power powerful and simple indicator. Uh, that's really ex exploded in recent years. Uh, and part of that is the development of biophysical ecology, uh, techniques where uh, people like Warren Porter and Michael Carney uh, can predict the body temperature of a lizard or a frog or an insect anywhere in the world quite accurately. Um, and that has allowed uh, whole new perspectives on understanding the global patterns of heat tolerance, cold tolerance, optimal temperatures, uh, trying to predict what's going to happen with climate warming. Uh, those techniques uh, really didn't exist when I was getting, well, they were just getting started uh, when I was a grad student. But they are now extremely sophisticated. Um, and uh, we're seeing uh, analyses on a global scale which never occurred when I was young. At the best, you might see a few islands in the Caribbean <laughs> uh, or a couple of sites on a latitudinal transect uh, in North America. But now the patterns are, are global. And uh, the work is obviously much more sophisticated than what we did. Is there a particular research outcome that has been, that has particularly surprised you or, or you're particularly proud of, perhaps? Uh, in, in early work, uh, work that Pianca and I did in the Kalahari Desert on foraging mode of, of lizards, looking at the difference between widely foraging and sit and wait lizards, uh, that one, I've, that was a nice set of studies, and we had a lot of fun doing that. Um, if I think back uh, about projects, you can think about projects that had an impact. And you can think about projects that you enjoy doing. Those are not necessarily the same. Uh, the ones that were the most fun are uh, maybe just because of the natural history of the system uh, or working with colleagues who you just 
had a great time. Um, if you, I guess if you're really lucky, both of those coincide. The project is not only great in terms of its impact, but it's, but it's fun to do. Um, but I would say, I guess, my main contribution is something that falls directly out of Janssen's hypothesis. And in that paper, he has a sentence that says something to the effect that it's not, that a f mountain pass is not a physical barrier. It's a barrier not because of the physical distance you have to go or the, the elevation you have to climb. It's because the animal experiences a temperature gradient. And what he was saying in effect was, you should not think about the physical environment in terms of meters um, or percent oxygen or something like that. You want to transduce that into a physiological impact. Um, and that's basically what I've done my entire career. So the origin of, of measuring thermal sensitivity using uh, a sprint speed uh, for lizards was specifically so I could say, what did it mean to be at a temperature 32 versus 34? How did that affect its performance? Uh, that's all a direct um, lesson from Janssen. Or another case, I worked with Peter Ward where we took historical data on oxygen content in the atmosphere. And Berner's data suggesting that in the Triassic oxygen dropped from to about 12%. Well, to an animal that's aerobic, that means that mountain passes were higher in the Triassic. It's a direct uh, application of Janssen going from a physical measurement to a physiological one. And that's, uh, I would say that's, that's what I've done. It's a very simple uh, transformation. Uh, I don't think Dan thinks anything of it. It's so obvious to him. But uh, I think it's proven to be extremely powerful, and, and I would say that's my main contribution. You said that probably your most widely read article is one where you give advice to PhD students. <laughs> so what is the key piece of advice you'd like to give to PhD students? Um, so th you're referring to a, a set of papers that Steve Stearns and I published. We originally gave them as a, an eco lunch at Berkeley. Um, and St Steve gave a uh, very cynical presentation on how to be a graduate student. And I gave a counterpoint, which was a much more optimistic point of view. And I would have to say we'd have to really take the lesson from both of those. And uh, we had two extreme views, which we presented intentionally. But the idea was not to say that one was good and one was bad, but that um, every student getting started is an individual. Um, and there is no one way to uh, become successful as a graduate student, because each of us is an in individual. But it is worthwhile thinking periodically, what are you doing? And uh, how, how can one go about um, furthering one's career? Um, and I would say probably the most, and, and this is held throughout my entire life, the single most important thing is to spend time with people who are excited about what they're doing. I often see graduate students break into groups. They're ones who are depressed and bad-mouthing their situation, and there are other ones that are over there, and they're talking about their research and learning uh, new ways to do things, and they're excited. Those are the people you want to be around because that rubs off. And um, uh, I've been very lucky to uh, be around some really smart, excited people. And um, uh, I'm happy to be parasitic off their energy <laughs> and their brilliance. It, I, I work better. I just have more fun. Um, I, yeah, I'd say that is. Spend time with people who are excited. And if somebody is depressed and down, avoid them. I mean, you may want to go help them as a friend, but spend your time and energy with, uh, with people who are really smart and doing creative things and enjoying it. Uh, it's just, it, it's magic. So. Given the projections of climate change, are you optimistic about the future or pessimistic, particularly in the context of conservation of lizards? Lizards? The modeling work that we did about four or five years ago suggested that, uh, in particular, tropical species were going to be vulnerable to extinction. 
we anticipated that some of the temperate zone species of lizards would actually do better because the environment would be warmer for longer times of year. Uh, but the work that's been done since then, a lot by Barry Sinervo, who's a former student of mine, uh, suggests in fact that we are seeing extinctions uh, even well outside the tropics. Um, and uh, so I would say for most species, no, we're not optimistic. And especially for the tropical lowland forest species that um, are surprisingly intolerant of high temperatures. I mean, I find it absolutely amazing that the least heat tolerant lizards in the world, the ones with the lowest critical thermal maximum or whatever measure you use, those live in the neotropical forests. I mean, there's a lizard in Puerto Rico you can get at 30 meters its lethal temperature is what a fence lizard in eastern Washington runs, prefers. I mean, they just cannot take the heat. Uh, and so the tropics are already warm. Their heat tolerance is low, so it's not going to take much warming in the tropics. It just puts, put them over the edge to extinction. So, and the second thing that can happen to make it worse, the open habitat lizards that live in the tropics are heat adapted. When the environment out there starts to get warm, they can move into the forest. So now the forest species are going to take a double hit. They're going to be heat stressed directly, and now they have competitors that will come into the forest. And that double whammy, uh, I think, is uh, spells doom for a lot of the lowland species. I, uh, I'm really worried about that. Is there a particular region or place which you would call your favorite in terms of field work? Oh, absolutely, the Kalahari Desert. Uh, I worked for Eric Pianca in 1969 and 70 and spent 10 and a half months there. So this was a couple of years after uh, the OTS course. Um, and the important thing there was spending a full year uh, and seeing seasonal changes. Um, because often we go to a place and we see a snapshot of just a few weeks or a month, one season. And especially in the temperate zones, but even in the tropics, the seasonality can be quite marked and things change. And seeing that uh, was really important to my career. And then coming back in subsequent years and seeing year-to-year -year variation, uh, being astonished. Uh, but I love the Kalahari just in part because of the physical environment and the organisms that are there. Um, I love it because of the projects that we did that were fun and it was, it was a very formative stage in my career where I was learning to think biologically. Um, and we just had a great time. Uh, yeah, that would certainly be my favorite place. And I'm going back in January, first time in uh, 30 years. so. Looking forward to that. <laughs> so, if you were if you were to have your and, and the opportunity to have your whole career again, would you choose to work on a different set of organisms, or would you still be passionate about lizards? I think um, I think I would still work on lizards. Uh, I mean, my initial interest, as I mentioned, was in birds, but. Lizards are very diverse. They live in great places. They're easy to work with, by and large. You can catch them, you can mark them, you can take their temperature. They don't fly away from you. They're not, some of them are nocturnal. Uh, but like a lot of mammals are nocturnal and they're just hard to work. Uh, but lizards for behavioral and ecological studies are often really good. And I think I would, the, the things that attracted to me, them to me, uh, in the late 60s, I think would still attract me now. Um, would I do something more applied? I don't know. Uh, but I've, I've certainly never regretted uh, any of the projects that I worked on. Um, even the ones that didn't work were, seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> there might have been circumstances why they didn't work, but. Uh, uh, no, I've been really lucky and had the great fortune of having a group of colleagues who thought like I did uh, 
Al Bennett, Paul Hertz, uh, Joel Kingsolver uh, in particular, uh, all of us had very similar interests and we tended to interact positively rather than competitively. And actually I think that's one other thing that I would say. Uh, in some fields of biology, in, applies to any field of science, you have people who have the similar interests and they get into a competitive relationship. That can be inspiring in some sense, but it's a hell of a lot more fun to collaborate. Uh, and if you have people uh, like Paul Hertz or Al Bennett or Joel Kingsolver, those interactions, rather than being competitive, just bring out the best in us. And uh, we developed much farther, much faster than we ever would have if we tried to uh, outcompete each other. Great place to end. It's okay. been really interesting talking to you. Good. And uh, good luck with the lizard work.